Okay, I'm gonna get started. Let's get stop poetry open mic. And it is 306. I have two poems to start off with. One, we'll just do one now. And you get to pick. One is rather quiet and thoughtful, and the other one is kind of loud and in your face. So it's up to you what we start with. <laughs> in your face. Okay, one voice. Okay, in your face. We're good for that. <laughs> yeah, slap me, baby. Okay. <laughs> goes without saying. It goes without saying. Oh, I'm not saying, but you know. You know what I'm saying. It goes without saying, but I'm saying it anyway. It had to be said. It had to be done. I see your dream and raise you four. You're not listening to me. Did I say something? Were you saying something? Were you listening to me just then? You're not listening to me. Not listening to me again. Was I saying something? What was that sound? Scraping the skyline, death knell rhapsody. It was an elegy. Breathed out the sky, elapsed out the street, sleeping at the bus stop, no shelter, shelter house. It's freezing out here waiting. You've got to walk it, walk it across. The blade cuts the street circular, saw, diamond saws, shaving rock smooth as butter marble. Jackhammer shakes it up. I want me a chainsaw instead of the baby. Although your babies couldn't be any sweeter. Sleep, baby, sleep, dream feet. Cut me up some concrete, concrete, smash it up, withstand, water side, lock side, gun shop, door stop, truck stop, lock knee, lock step. Projects, boxes, you make us all live in boxes, right angle vision, lack of vision. Your response to gravity is control, sparity. I'm itching to scratch, I'm scratching it off. What do I win? I don't need nothing. I've got what I need. I'm one of the lucky ones for now. I like those magic numbers, magic numbers underneath. Spinning them, spinning, dusting silver circles, mysteries underneath, mignonette shambles, all he's got he's carrying in his overalls, on his back, in two exploding garbage bags. His sorrow dog follows, loyal, droop-eared shadow. Where did they sleep last night? Where did they used to live alone? Bubba Chernobyl, Bechtel ghost, what your daddy's not saying, what he won't, what won't be known won't stick. White bluff district. It was the mob that killed her. Now that mob's gone and we've got new others. Kill you in a heartbeat and Godfather's made millions, millions sopranos. You are what you glorify, wild west mantras. Picture the overpass rusting slow underneath you. Here come those kids, we better run. I'm done. Some of those kids gone crazy on us now and the money goes to lock them up, not to save them, not to save them. I've been to despair. I have a summer home there, but I can't afford to go. Cumplia danos, get a stiletto, blood assurance. He sells some plasma for the cash. It's shock. I can't talk. TV Babylon jumpstart this evolution with a nightmare with a seed. Go deep, go long, evolve already, L lose the myth, play with myth, litter tribe, patchwork, Amazon, Oregon, apportioned, apportioned Illinois, trees, real estate school, liberty school, we just got the one civics course. Did that teach us what we need to know? Be a nurse. Write your congressman. Tell him what for, what you think. Do you think about it? How the questions rise. Tell him what you think. Tell him why. Malcolm on one side and Martin on the other. Portraits I gaze at. Their eyes in the church. Gone, not gone. Gone, not gone, not gone. People like that don't die. I won't let them take them from me. You can't kill fires that bright. It would be Jefferson Street. It would be Charlotte. It would be Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Irony seems to have no end. Irony becomes surreal. When the facts become irrelevant, my facts against your facts, you're spinning it, man. It's a game to you, right? White Bluff District, 
White Bluff District. If you don't like the game, get out of the box. Hit them on the head with the facts again. Does it ever sink in? It goes without saying, oh, I'm not saying, but you know, you know what I'm saying. It goes without saying, but I'm saying it anyway. It had to be said, it had to be done. I see your fire and raise you one. You're not listening to me. Did I say something? Were you saying something? Were you saying something to me just then? You're not listening to me. Not listening to me again. Was I saying something? Tomorrow is now. You're sitting in it. I see your hunger and raise you three. What was that sound? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me check and see if we have other people who are trying to get in real quick. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Hello, Henry. Can you hear me? Henry, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Good. Welcome. Good to see you. Oh, yeah. How you doing? Well, happiness is hearing a Henry Jones read poetry, I think. I agree. Uh, I agree. I don't know about all always, that. He always brings it. I don't know about all that. I think I do like everybody else. The best <laughs> I can and keep on moving. Modesty, modesty wears well on you, sir. Oh, thank you. I like your work as well. I think you guys know that. Mm -hmm. Only every once in a while. Well, let's get started with the open mic. With Who's here so far? Let's see. Francesca, would you, instead of be fifth, would you like to be first today? Uh, sure. I guess I'll put my camera on real fast if you want me okay. to. Okay. Thank you. And grab my grab my stuff. I'm just gonna do something real quick though. So that's cool. Like I said, I'm not really um, not all here because of my weeks thing. Okay. I got one. I'm doing like a little series of like things that, that happen. And uh, so this one's called Claim Me. Claim me, a letter left at the post office. Claim me, a bag left at the grocery, on the grocery cart. Claim me, a suitcase in the lost and found. Claim me, money abandoned in a secret bank. Claim me, a shoe that was left in a locker. Claim me, a book left on a subway. Claim me, a ink pen left at the doctor's office. Claim me a hat left at the rodeo. Claim me a guitar left backstage at a concert. Claim me a nail hammered in the wrong board. Claim me a check on the desk made out to you. Claim me a child abandoned on the sidewalk. Claim me a tree growing in a field. Claim me. And thank you. Thank you for letting me be your monster. Thanks. Wow. I love your imagery, all of those. Spot on. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Henry, would you? Hey, I'll take out your phone and put a catwalk for the stage right now. Would you mute, please? Okay. Okay. Need to mute someone. Okay. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Henry, would you like to be next? Thank you. This poem is titled Yellow Eyes. Yellow Eyes Television Beyond Russian Gen Cravings. Morning remorse alarms me. Warmth left too soon. Not the same as touching, but close enough for the illusion. Liquid prophecy flowing, numbing, and inspiring me. Who will save us now? Fluids to make me feel here. Phantom friends reflected in the glass, in the empty glass, and empty me. Thank you. Wow. Wow, that was so powerful. I love your imagery as well. Very concise and it moves really well. 
Joy, would you like to be next? Okay. <laughs> okay, let me get this up in front of me. Okay, this is called Chernobyl. The wolves of Chernobyl are no heroes, but they are martyrs sacrificed on the pyres of the nuclear engine. No mistake about it, there is a death sentence. Don't eat honey from Chernobyl or rescue ebony or wear skins from there. Watch for a time. What dies at Chernobyl is imperishable. No ochre required because the bugs are gone. Wow. Love that. Thank you. When did you write that? Uh, maybe, I think actually earlier this year, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Like um, this spring, March or something like that, I think. You got a train. <laughs> yeah, sorry, my, and, and then I, I had an email come in and a job board notification come in. So you probably heard my <laughs> computer go bing, bong, bing, you know, so sorry about what? that. The train is cool. Oh, I also live pretty close to um, a, a, a ambulance place too, so that can happen at any moment. Also, <laughs> we get lots of like people gunning their engines up and down the street. Oh yeah, no, I don't get too much of that. Thank you. Cool though, because they're very expressive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nathan, would you like to be next? Excuse me, you're muted. Yeah, I think you're muted. Let's see. I'm you muted go. again. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I've got a um, tiny poem um, that was published earlier this year in an anthology. Um, put out by Harvard College Children's Stories uh, called Goldfish, Germs, and Galaxies. And it's <clears throat> stories and poems um, uh, related to the pandemic for children. Um, and this is a uh, very tiny poem called Looking Out My Window. Um, and I think it's my first attempt at writing a children's poem. And, um, anyway, looking out my window, even though I am very small, I can look out and see the sky. Each little thing like me that is underneath the sky flies like a bird across my mind. Its wings are my own two eyes. Wow. I love how you turn it into the bird's eyes at the end, that the way you morph it. That's a great morph. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Now I'm looking to see. I'm missing some folks for our open mic and I'm also missing my feature poet. Let's see, just a sec. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yes, who's that? Hello? Hello? Hello, who's that? Hello, this is Cynthia, Hello. can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Cynthia. Now you're not gonna believe yeah. this. You're not gonna believe this, Cynthia, but you are next on the open mic. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, that's amazing. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if I read last <laughs> that that's amazing. <laughs> I just got a break and I pulled up into a cemetery and I found a Wow. 
Um, That's magical. Um, all right, well, I I have a record that I read to you guys in, in July, and I'm guessing I didn't read in August. I'm guessing I was busy on the census. That is fine. Thank you for joining us. Okay. All right. Well, if I read for you in July, then I would have shared Ilsa chapter one, which was the beginning of this novel. Well, not the beginning. It's it's, it's a, the first chapter of one character in this novel. And so here's chapter two for Ilsa. He came by in an old rattletrap pickup truck, pulling up just beyond the caution, caution tape and sitting, waiting, all stealthy, like a cat for its prey. Being prey wasn't part of my intention, not for the day. Not that I had formulated Betty by that hour, but falling underneath a scruffy bearded old black man was clearly not on the list. The old man is patient to a fault, I'll give him that, sitting quietly in the truck, sometimes glancing over towards me. Soon an hour must have passed. That's what the son's physician told me. The waiting became excruciating. What were his intentions? He actually looked pretty friendly, but I'd been prey too many try times to trust easily. Was he seeking prey? For some reason, I didn't sense that from this man. And while he could very well have had nefarious intentions, my gut said otherwise. As I watched him sitting in his truck, oh, so very patiently waiting for multiple hours, I couldn't see what he was doing, but by the mid-afternoon hour, I was fully convinced that he was not seeking prey, even though it was a form of stalking all this waiting. Somehow I sensed his motives were pure. This man meant me no harm. Seated patiently in that old truck, it was almost like he was keeping me company. His intentions held no malice. Curious, I slid open the side panel with a screech, eager to discover God's intentions for my day. I'm ready, Lord, I declared, stepping forth into damp sunshine. I won't postpone your new gift another hour. Closing the door to my abode, I strode forth to the truck. No worries about falling prey to the strange old man who spent about half a day, who just spent about half a day waiting for a white girl he doesn't know to emerge from a dumpster. Waiting, quietly, never calling out, just demonstrating good intentions by honoring my need for time to decide about this very unusual man. By the time I'd crossed the small lawn, it felt like another hour had passed. So sure was I that my status was not that of prey, I was eager to reach that truck and see what God's intentions were for me for that hour. Certain that all that waiting wasn't making me prey, I greeted the man. Hi, I'm Ilsa and climbed into his truck. Thank you. Thank you. That's very intriguing. <laughs> Thank, you. <in> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we have more have joined us. We have Andrea Pyle, Karen Parker, and we have Dane Ing, last name. Okay. Int. Okay. Int. Now, John Wessick was going to read, if you have time. Do you have time with us here? Yes, I do. Sure. Awesome. Would you like to be next? Okay. Change the glasses here, get the book, and we'll roll. This is uh, called Instructions for Exile. Where will you go now that sanity's hoarse voice is barely a whisper? And the house that Reagan built crumbles on its foundation of wishful thinking. Take the gifts your nation gave you. Sew a thought, a poem, or a book in the lining of your coat and join the diaspora of reason. Leave your countrymen to their chosen fates. Help them by sheltering language and meaning far away 
fleeing the nation of black lung monkey trials and thalidomide babies where dime store preachers rants on the AM dial drown out the screams from the torture chambers. Flee the new deal that became the same old deal. Flee the $8 an hour Walmart American dream. Flee the crowded jails, the union busters, pregnant teens draping hopes on rusty coat hangers and wars declared to win popularity contests. Before silver wings cut cumulus clouds and sever your past, look down at what you lost. Weep for the smell of bacon and eggs on a crisp Colorado morning. Weep for the cold steel wind off Lake Michigan, for backyard barbecues, corn on the cob, and lightning bugs on a warm summer night. Weep for tree houses and tire swings. Weep for drive-in movies and first cars with wide back seats. Weep for ruby-throated hummingbirds and fresh tortillas on an Austin night. Weep for veterans sipping orange crush, their uniforms threaded with needle points of shrapnel. America has wasted so much. Thank you. Wow. I love how you balance that out, John, with the the re, the sad and dark reality and the bright reality. It really blends well, and you wove it well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. Now, anyone else want to read who has not yet read? Right. Okay. Uh, Dane, would you like to read next? Yes. And generally, some of Brian Franco. It's taking me a second to get organized here. You're fine. Okay. Time All right. for a drink. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, a good garden. Before the flood on the river stick, before everything burned to the ground, when I was sleeping on a bed of fresh hay, before the dark day was bright as noon black, I never noticed all the same before the after, the beginning, the end, no line between sleeping, waking, painless joy for lack of appreciation of the dark side of the rainbow where I find myself lost. I see you shining out my temporary cottage window beyond distant mountain, forest, pines. Whistle, sing me out to play out of my dark house painted pain between ultraviolet and infrared, tip-top dance on stars. This is a good garden, grown by you. I can live here a while, knowing what I know now. Peace, you warm on my face, sunshine wisdom, bodhisattva, bodhi sunshine. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. It was, it was psychedelic in there, the imagery that was really I love the trippiness of that. That's the reality of that. And um, wow, you were flying. <laughs> you were flying. Thank you. And we have generally, generally Brian Franco. Thank you. Um, welcome. I like to think that poetry is sort of a combination of jazz and beat poetry, but it's avant-garde jazz, so it's avant-garde jazz beat poetry. So. That's, That's what I can pretty specialized. That's amazing. So here we go. Um, I'm, I'm going to do an unfinished poem that I've been working on. I, was, I stopped about two weeks ago, and I wrote part, part of this actually this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, it, just started, it just came to me. Sometimes that happens, you know. That's so it's, um, it's tentatively titled, if I can get to the top of it. Well, it's generally titled Shrinking Wingback Chairs and Credit Card Readers. The reality that part of everyone's history fades into oblivion is a bit sublime. Memories once strong in our minds creating hurt and anger and confusion are disappeared by a collective subconscious stored in gray matter nooks and crannies transformed into triggers raring and ready to spray bullets of seemingly hidden personal trauma into the atmosphere of now. People who think they knew, know you well, or even just a little bit, will whisper amongst themselves, I would have never guessed he, he hit it well. Even those who knew you via nods and waves across rooms will voice their thoughts about 
the supposed scene you made they witnessed. But the whispering gossip is more like yelling at the top of their lungs because what good is gossip if the target isn't around to hear? Your therapist gives you the option of sitting on a wingback chair with the perfect 90 degree, upright 90 degree back or an overly cushy leather couch that makes you feel the need to nap. The one time you sat on the leather couch, you fell asleep. Instead of nudging your shoulders, you threw a throw pillow at your head. Your trust for her grew exponentially after that incident. When she runs your credit card through a white square attached to a cell phone, you are reminded this, that this conversation is a business transaction partially covered by insurance, but at least it's partially covered. You reluctantly share what she calls a breakthrough. The utterance of this loaded word loads a, the thought in your head that she has awarded you an esteemed honor, and there will be a plaque on her wall engraved with the date of each new breakthrough you make. But there is no plaque. Words like breakthrough are only good for the moment. She says there's, there's a lot of work yet to do to move forward. You have homework that you don't turn in, but it should turn your life right side in, as if you accidentally wore your shirt inside out and a barista mentions it to you and you go into the bathroom to fix it. But life doesn't provide us with personal baristas to expose our dilemmas and resolve it by using a key attached to an espresso, espresso machine tamper. You spend multiple sessions in that wingback chair regurgitating your past and present to a person required by law to keep your confidence. And you have a brother that thinks sharing your personal information without your permission with anyone he pleases is his fraternal right and your other brother who respects your privacy won't get involved in, as to not rock the proverbial family boat. So you wonder why your family can't allow you a basic sense of privacy or familial confidentiality that should supersede what the doctors, lawyers, shrinks, and clergy are, are obligated to give and seems to only exist from your side of the relationship. It's strange how the mention of someone's name or the voice of someone else on your voicemail will set off a train of thought that seems to have an endless track that sometimes comes dangerously close to the edges of cliffs and seems through avalanche zones that require the train to blow its whistle at maximum volume. It's as if you owned an AK-47 with the safety super glued shut, but the trigger is activated by data wedged in a crevice in the Siberian sector of your medulla oblongata, and no amount of industrial adhesive can keep that safety from slipping open and ruining a closet full of designer suits, shirts, shoes, and ties. And that's all I've got so far. Amazing. Oh my God. Yes. Very brilliant. Love it. Keep keep at that one. <laughs> oh, yes. You're welcome. Okay, let's see. Just checking. Would anyone else like to read who has not read yet? Andrea or Sh or Sharon or the other person? I don't know your name yet. <laughs> no. Okay. Would anyone else who has read, I believe Francesca would like to read again. Anyone else who has read like to read after that? Well, I can certainly go again. That was John? Yes. Okay, John. I'll go, I'll go again. Okay, good, okay. And this is Cynthia, I'll go again. We got it, okay. Okay, we'll try to get some order. Okay, I'll go again too, uh, hey, up on the bandwagon. <laughs> okay, all right. So, Francesa, if you'll go next. Thank you. You're welcome. I thank everybody for reading again. Like I said, mine are going to be short because I'm um, unwanted, a child unwanted. Mom and dad both stay, not mine. Sometimes even a bird leaves her nest behind. Um, not to blame anyone for disregard. If you stop and ask them, your parents worked very hard. Now. What issue do we have unwanted? Sometimes being left alone to learn. While the world keeps turning around, not to mention being in the same home, the feeling of those words, silent and true, 
Does this unwanted disease spread? Who is the blame for this shame? Not everything is unwanted. In Hollywood, not even a birth name. Thank you. You're unmuted, Amy. Unmute yourself, Amy. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you. I'm so sorry. I was saying, Francesca, thank you for sharing that with us. That was beautiful. And John Wessick is the next person. Okay. Uh, this is called Pandemic Nation. We live in a single nation now. Towers of ice and granite, North Atlantic breakers beating white sand, fragrant forests of cedar and hemlock, boulevards and crowded cafes, merely forbidden landscapes behind window glass. Whether Minneapolis or Calcutta, ventilation keeps the climate at a comfortable 72 degrees. Separation the only thing that can unite us. The working poor have their own nation, a nation of peril and starvation wages, armed guards at the border, relations undiplomatic, more exiles every day. Rather, check. <laughs> I'm rather speechless about that. That's brilliant the way you've gone all over almost like Walt Whitman or like a modern Walt Whitman to just different parts of what you see but much shorter much shorter <laughs> much shorter you're right thank you you're welcome and next we have Generalissimo Brian Franco oh okay bear with me you're welcome got to be quicker than I thought you were okay um Okay, this is called Chicago. The car broke down halfway to Chicago. Winter wind was blowing, no snow was snowing, so I stuck up my thumb, not knowing what was to come. Took a magic carpet ride, opposite magic, and the windy city wasn't quite as pretty as I thought it would be. I rode the road home fast and free through rain, snow, and sleet. My feet got soaked, but they always seemed to know how to find their way back to dry and clean. The car wasn't mine. It must have been a sign that the sun don't shine for only me. After all, flowers gotta grow, wind will always blow, and people will sing songs no one else will know. Others write poems no one else will read. Some poems will never find their way to paper, lost in thought streams of poets treading water through their thoughts. Some say a poem is just a poem, a song is just a song. The world is what it is, not the bits and go on and on. But every thought may be a poem, and every word on a poem can be read by a million different people in a million different ways, and every poem may be a song that can be sung by a million different people a million different ways. Dreams happen when we sleep, even happen when we're awake. The daytime sun always shines when somewhere else the moon and tides align. I'm always swimming through my thoughts because they get tangled in the air I breathe. This is why when my life starts making sense, my senses take their lead. I believe the car was a metaphor without a meaning, and every poem I think up is an open door I can choose to close or just walk through. After all, flowers gotta grow, and wind will always blow, but a poem is never just a poem, a song is never just a song, and Chicago will always be Chicago. Gracias, everybody. Wow. Well, gracias to you. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I love the thoughts going through the head and morphing you were morphing you're morphing <laughs> okay now we have three more poets who want to read and from the view of the gallery here it looks like joy is right there with joy would you like to be next okay so i picked out one that's about writing poetry which i think maybe follows the last one pretty good and maybe it's funny or maybe maybe it's touching i don't know anyway 
I named it Sigh. Midnight comes and finds me groping, summoned to write a poem. This will not be a sonnet, just motley words. I've tried a lot of tricks, some I forgot already. Anagrams have served me well, acrostics unfurled handily. Tonight, it's decidedly unheroic couplets when I finally get to work. They're broken all to hell and maybe too banal to share. But still could be unpreparedness is a goodly portion of what a poem is. Leaves room for the intake of breath, a space to resume your wonder. These two lines I write because I must confine my regard to this page. Oh, very clever. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing. Henry, would you like to be next? <laughs> This poem is titled, Becoming More or Less. The playful gathering of dancing children, of dancing fingers running like children stumping through a field of wildflowers who became lost now searching for their way back home through a portal flipping through pages of a colorful storybook where fascination explodes with the drizzle of colors. They chase the shadows of friends playing hide and seek, silhouettes reaching for life and its dimensions, hoping perhaps to find each other within themselves. Then looking between blades of grass and under soil and rocks, young minds filled with wonder and imagination to the twisted realm where Alice plays with the caterpillar, sipping on tea, enjoying the trembling of being frightened. She awakens something inside her that others fear, afraid to connect and become the flow to the center, churning the old cream of joy to a froth of truth, made into a frosting to coat the layers of sweet lies of the earth where old bones wait ascension, but the pile becomes nothing but a kindling to make flames rise. No one finds their remains, regardless of the watery eyes or how the bellows of grief echo through the waves. The hope is to dance, to try to forget or to remember. Nothing is easy to release the damned emotions. Alice transmuted into goddess, part water, earth and pain. She listens for the magical words and ancient songs in the air. Her ears patiently open and feels deeply to the gentle winds. Nearby sycamore trees, tree roots grab her legs to steal her. Stars bent by time, she runs between doorways to quickly hide. This isn't the moon she knows, but, she, but is a garden full of promise. She twirls the new sun's flames, reaching inside ourselves a plot, planting seeds while searching, while teaching us to extend our minds and hopes, showing us to play with fire to become and see more. We trace through the ashes, smelting high towers of steel, hoping to reach her and in many ways to become like her. Science and creation reaching to the skies, strong, long arms, wanting to embrace and retrace paths to palaces she flew to us. We only wanted to feel whole again for just one moment. No longer memories of the abandoned lover seeking the familiar, touches and smiles without anger and bitterness from the past, while sadness drapes us waiting to just understand why love wasn't plentiful enough to fill the emptiness. This hunger lingers consuming the reach of old passions, building atop unhealed wounds covered with expired balm, soothing nothing as blistering heated nuggets add to hardness only truly designed to feel strong 
and unbreakable again. Lock the pain in our sacred space where we forget everything. The shuffled red flowers fall like cowrie shell prophecy, ascribing words to know how foolish is our foolish ways. Point, um, excuse me, leaving our mountain to let the sun melt away into night while resting and waiting as the worm still stirs honey, sweetening our flesh to eat before his emergent flight, pouring the overbrewed tea back into the rivers, streams around and inside us, pushing the edges of shores, which help us constantly thirst, feel our thirst to build, come to an end. Lego clusters, we hope, won't tumble and crash our dreams, crush our dreams. Peaked houses, nothing but tall shadows of ourselves, built atop the graves of brittle marrow and dry blood, which cause so much pain, but wanting now only joy. As we still hope to understand our purpose from the high, Looking at the clouds floating near the penthouse rooftop, smoking clouds, the worm ponders in his high back chair, while Alice laughs at our toys, knowing with just one blow. We tumble down in the flights of our fantasy to be gods. She gave us the dreams and memories, but we shut our eyes as the story's pages turn, showing us ways to build within. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, it was like a graphic novel. And it, the emotional aspect as well. I'm not muted, am I? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank I've been, you in, so been in love with Alice for a while on a couple of poems. Yeah. That was awesome. That was so good. Thank you. Now we have Dane. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, I'm going to try this. Uh, <clears throat> would you would you like to dance with me? The words cannot form out of my mouth. I, I fall down drinking punch, junior high school punch, hummingbird feeder food, blood red number two, so you can see when it's gone. So you can miss it. It needs you to miss it. Or you will not sleep all night. I will read vapid, mindless, today in Nashville, hiding my private pain, old, stale, broken me. Who needs a roadmap? Just look me up on the socials. Hook me up. The stumble. Me, 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 me. Adjective me, intransitive me, pluperfect me, adverbial me. Me, 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 me. Stupid sorrow singer warm up for the serving of cold guts, teenage joke, ants, zombie dialect, eludes. Do you want to dance, hack poems, phlegm, the horrors, quick step, quick, quick. Here comes the vomit truck. It's a secret dance called the stumble. Dance the falling, tripping, dance the blindness, silent, dance with empty shirt, smell, faint, fading, lost. Shiver in the corner to the back, beat down, beat, beat down. Shiver is the new step. It's all so exciting, the generation of useless. You cannot live without it. Prim, white, gloves, sepia, snapshot, gray, dead, you, crazy. The dharma of broken things that never mend. The dharma of sunshine, the dharma of misty mountaintop. The dharma of none of that, the dharma of the door. Yes, one foot, one foot, the other. Other is a boot, the kicking, busy, stumble, falling, getting up, falling, falling, one, two, three, one, two, three. The wailing, the wailing, ruined, wrecking, waltz. It's a direction, secret dance step. 
impossible to dance yet simple by yourself just let it be falling satori dolman the long time holding the stumble in the dharma the stumble is a dharma my own stumble all my own has its own dance steps do you know them too thank you that was such a journey awesome Thank you. Nathan, would you like to read? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> I've got a couple poems in the new October issue of Poetry Magazine, um, which like all, all the content will be available um, digitally like available online the, the issue will be online um early october probably october 1st or 2nd um uh, but print copies are hitting people's mailboxes uh right now um and this poem is um it's got a nice um october -y, um cover and um, uh, this poem is called Bee Monster. All mouth, out of orbit due to an insatiable need to be orbited. At some point there are clouds or waves filled with the foul kelp of cornering questions. Like a black hole yeeting a star through space, it was real when monster queried, why do you think you carry a small stack of books with you? Out of orbit is perhaps a phantasmagoria of blankness. It was real when the foolishness I was meant to feel oozed from the kelp instead. What I carried out of my own need was innocuous enough. It felt how pages smelled as I turned them. Like Don Quixote made a helmet, I wanted to make the books with their sturdy corners a shield. I succeeded almost, almost except an impulse rose as I walked starly away from monster. Almost except it is impossible to protect what I was protecting indefinitely. Naivety that is ready to crumble does. When it crumbles, its pieces fall into a womb where the thing most feared gestates. All mouth, all hunger, all claw, all tooth, all stir of disorder, I now will be hidden and large, 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 as the thick-haired ocean of space. Brilliant, so brilliant. Hard to say things. <laughs> that was awesome, thank you, thank you. Now we have two people, we have Andrea and Sharon. Would either of you like to speak? We also have a mystery person that we don't know. I'm sorry. Am I the mystery person? Are you at Cynthia? Am I the mystery person? person? Thank you. you. I couldn't see your name. <laughs> yeah, Cynthia. Yeah, 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 because I'm on the phone. Sorry. Yes. Um, I'd like to share another chapter if you want one. Are we cool? We good? Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is such a great group to be part of. I'm just amazed. Anyway, uh, Ilsa, Chapter 3. The old truck was a mess, full of papers and such. Obviously, the man's office on wheels. I liked him already. He wasn't out to impress anybody. I'm Ilsa, I said again, and waited while he looked me over. You're cautious. That's good, Mrs. Miss Ilsa. You're a survivor, he said, lisping a bit, his speech indistinct. 
hard to grasp with my ear. His face was deeply lined, expressive, and most importantly, kind. It's odd that I could tell so much as he wore a black cloth mask of the kind that's plain and functional, protection from the COVID-19 virus. His eyes lit, I could see his wheels turning. You got any valuables you want to bring along, he asked and urged. Grab them now, before I could grasp that this old man was offering me respite from living in my dumpster, where anybody could invade my privacy at any minute. He was right. I am a survivor, for I've now entered a new chapter. I'm not sure what it looks like quite yet. I, as I hesitate only a moment, duck out, dash to the dumpster and look. Grab my hoodie and backpack with school books from when we had school and two kinds of licorice inside. The old man's right, I'm a survivor. Snatching up my copy of Keisha's house, I drag the bag, I drop the bag to its wheels and roll to the faded green pickup, surer than anybody that God has somehow secured me firmly in his grasp. For this old man is offering me something, not grasping at me like I'm a sweet young thing who's available or looking greedily at my body like men do when they don't think anybody is watching. No, he waited for hours and then looked at my face with kindly eyes. Abandoning my home for the past weeks, I sigh in relief as the wheels of the man's truck begin to roll. I am a survivor, that's for sure. For who other than a survivor would have had the good sense to grasp for her freedom from mom's world and roll out her own wheels and set off for parts unknown? I left, I looked at a map online and decided that this neighborhood was the kind in which I could get lost and not found in. One where anybody could reinvent herself to be not a victim. One where anybody could become a strong, independent survivor. Not sure why, because since settling in, I've seen all kinds of people, mostly black, off and limping or scarred, so I grasped that life here might not be as easy as it first looked, but I could still see, and my wheels were turning, that many survivors exist here, even if their wheels are on a bicycle or a scooter or a rolling walker. It seemed like anybody, or so it looked to me, could find a kind of life here, putting freedom from home life within my grasp. Thank you. That's all. That was amazing. I'm really Thanks. compelled by your story there. <laughs> Stay tuned. To come back and more about Ilsa. <laughs> she, she has three more chapters so far, so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, Andrea or Sharon, would you guys like to read? All right. Is it okay if I read one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. This one's a little calmer than the last one. All right. And, the, and these two, the ones that I'm reading today are part of, oh, I'm forgetting the name. That's crazy. Narco, Narco Magazine. Narco Magazine. I believe that's correct. Necro. Necro. Okay, Grace M. Eaton and Belmont. One, the drive straight in is blocked off with wooden beams. You have to park in the glass on the street. On the way in, the toddlers light up when I smile at them. One reaches out to take my hand at the water fountain. My soul is brightened. I don't ever want him to let go, and the adult leading me leads me on to let go. The older children get close to me, but don't always answer when I speak. The adults and I are different. We're warm and shy, warm and shy, working through our new society. She hears the helicopter, says she wonders who died. They're looking for somebody on that bridge, you know it. He says, did you hear about, I gotta go, she says. But she stays and he says, yeah, I heard. At first I didn't know who they were talking about because we all knew him as Peter Rabbit. We can't make it to 30, he says. That's what they say. And we're all shaking our heads. When we talk politics, waiting for the others. She says, remember us. 
I want to say we're fighting for you out there. We do remember you. Do I do enough? He touches my arm on the way out and I know it's good I came. Good I'll be back again. I know. Two. How green it is blocks away. How quiet and green romaine and organic olive oil on sale at sunshine and a freedom first bumper sticker on a white truck means the freedom to carry guns and that's about it. And on the way home, I see a whole white family out walking slow with one in the stroller and one in white diapers and that child's free hand is just as light as the others across town. But the adults so calm, walking and talking, driving by in my car and listening to us three. The white couple turns and looks at me. Just another brother on lockdown, he sings and they're afraid of me. It's the beat, it's the beat. I do remember you sinking into this grain, into this pulse. Do I do enough? <laughs> That's that one. <laughs> Oh, well, anyone else want to read? We've got a little bit more time. I'm looking for my, hmm, looking for my feature. I'm not sure where my feature is today. You give your feature too much leeway. <laughs> Maybe so. She was going to jump in. You need to be a sterner taskmaster. Come on, Amy. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> I understand. I, I have classroom management problems because I can't tell people what to do. <laughs> I, I have a lot to say about teaching in, in classrooms in high school that one year. One year. Uh, but I never taught in high, well, I have taught a tiny bit in high school, um, you know, uh, substitute teaching, stuff like that, but even in college. All right, I can't well, anybody else want to read? Do one more poem. I would love that, Nathan. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so uh, th this poem uh, <clears throat> was published uh, earlier this year in American Poetry Review. Um, I was very excited. It actually made the back cover of um, the magazine, which is is uh, a coveted coveted spot. Um, and this is called a candle in the night. Uh, anybody that I'm connected with on Facebook, there's um, a, an editor named James Cruz. Uh, who is also a poet, but he is putting an anthology together um, that will come out in August from Story Press uh, called How to Love the World, Poems of Hope and Gratitude. Um, and this poem will also be in that anthology, but he made a, he, he does Poem of the Week videos and he made a nice video, reading the poem, and uh, commenting on it, um, and um, I just I feel like he did such a great job of reading it. He probably does a better job than, than I do, and then he, he just had such insightful things to, to say about it, um, but so it's worth uh, uh, you know, kind of scrolling down my timeline a little bit to click on his video and, and hear him, but um, Short of that, uh, I'll read my own poem, um, A Candle in the Night. Um, <clears throat> Stone is tender to lichen. Lichen is tender to the earth and its other inhabitants. What are you and I tender to? When a black hole swallows a star, it must do so tenderly, since a universe hinges on tenderness. At midnight, your candle burns with tenderness, dreamlike in an amber votive, its flame flickering 
tenderly. Oh my gosh. Nathan, that's so amazing. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I wrote a poem once uh, called Love is the Motive Force of the Universe, and it, it reminded me of that. That makes, sense. that makes sense. I don't know where it is, but I, w I won't try to find it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you use the word tender throughout the poem and with so many different meanings, meanings and that was great. Thank you. Anybody else want to read? You want to read, Joy? Would you? Um, yeah, I could read another one. You guys want me to read another one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, here's one uh, called Mount Kilimanjaro, and it's about um, me and my friend Nancy who separately, when we were um, teenagers, went to, had seen Mount Kilimanjaro, and, and then we decided together that we, at some point, wanted to go back and, and um, hike up to the top of it. Anyway, so Mount Kilimanjaro. We made a promise to each other want to one day go back to Africa and climb Mount Kilimanjaro. That venerable snow-capped old man has always stayed in my heart. But the budding, swelling possibilities of youth really cannot survive the harsh conditions that arise in the days that make up adulthood. Everything seemed, everything used to seem so easily in reach, just a matter of stretching out and grabbing the opportunity. I just knew was barreling towards coming up. We never talk about it. The absurd dream of Africa and the mountain on the edge of the Serengeti. It's the current realization of its absurdity that helps me see the privilege I enjoyed as a youth, for one thing. For another, I have come lately to know I do not want to go back to East Africa. The place that was there in the 70s is gone, and I'm afraid to see animal suffering against the crush of a larger human throng. Thank you. That was beautiful. You took Thank us you. there. You took us there. I did. <laughs> I always think that I just write about my cogitations. I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I just, that's where I, I'm not really an image poet. poet. <laughs> well, it, the Im images are there. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad to hear that you heard them. Good. Anyone else? Brian? Dane? No, no, no. <laughs> yes. Okay, Dane? Wait, okay. Yes, let me see if I have something else. I do have something else. Uh, it is going to be very different. Uh, destination murder. Full of my brain. So much Saturday laundry. The rotating fan in the corner pushes its little heart's worth of heat from one corner to the other corner. Still hot, sweaty, 11 p.m. night. Cracked concrete, hard. I'm on my back smoking. Wonder how long the plume lasts. Longer than gunshot, last blood spurt. Flip a coin to bet myself. I win, I lose again. Looking up at the ceiling apocalypse, empty Hiram's rye bottle on the floor, ice bucket, ice bucket few drops left of slush. It's a, road tie, it's a roadside motel, hot and strangeness. Number 41 this month. I carry a gun. It's a job. It's a blink from before midnight to the first bird chirp. No sleep, no shower, dress, coat, hat, shirt, tie, hangman's noose loose. I'm sweaty. It's sweaty. It's a bad, bad day. I head for bad breakfast in a bad coffee shop in black and 
bad stubble reflection. The coffee steam clears in a moment. I see me in the bottom of the coffee cup. May the waitress slings coffee all day. Putting on my hat, I watch her and wonder, lighting a cigarette. She moves through the diner, looking through the windows. I wonder, with that body in mind, what she does for fun. There is nothing but shade. Still, it's hot. No place for coolness. On the highway, now heading west, Route 66. Destiny, murder, destination, hell. Thank you. That was very vivid and bold and a great story. Great adventure. And I hope we haven't murdered anyone. <laughs> That's always good. <laughs> it's the destination. It's the it's what's coming later. <laughs> oh, well. It's foreboding. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Let's see. We have a new person here. Lantern Carrier, would you like to read? Would you like to read? <laughs> yes, I wouldn't mind. I, I wouldn't mind, thanks. You're wonderful. <laughs> I, just, I just this moment came on, but sure, fine. Okay. <laughs> um, right, the courtesan. They, they, they say she is a concubine. One courted by emperors and kings, engaged in power games at luscious banquets, lavish lifestyles as well as fetishes for the opulent and powerful. They say I'm a courtesan, but what about those who give gold and expensive trinkets for my services? Am I less human? Are they so undefiled that they have the right to solicit violations on my dignity? and self-respect. They seek ungodly acts, which can only leave me unsanctified with pain in my soul. Maybe some Romans were callous, uncaring, lust-driven humans of outer affluence. Perhaps they took advantage of the downtrodden and oppressed. Perchance in the Garden of Eden, a zealot painted me red with an apple of scars that even today, still need to be removed from the corridors of shadows in men's souls. I am a strand from the harp of the melody which we are, all struggling for meaning in this dense fog of shadows. I adorn myself with the robe of survival, which although colored in scarlet, allows me to endure, strive for the pinnacle of excellence. I am a rose and the sweet scent from which all garlands came. And yes, thorns do linger like leeches, but will inevitably be burnt by a cauldron of fire in my soul. I am the dawn walking upon the lap of another glorious sunrise. And even though my precursor undresses the darkness to rebuke my spirit, light has anointed the heavens with twinkling stars. You may weep for me, but keep your thoughts sacred Enslave me not with emptiness like the emperor does, but let your chairs kiss my heart with empathy and compassion, ringing bells for its victory, chanting praises, the glories of love, plant and carrier. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I was, I wasn't. I was in a spiritual conference, so I couldn't come before. Thank you. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. We appreciate you being here. Anyone else like to read? Anyone else like to read? Well, I think we've come to the end, sadly. Lantern Carrie, you just got here at the end. Ooh, I just, I just made it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, next time it'll be earlier and we'll, and everything. Did you say something? <laughs> Dane? 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 No, I didn't say anything, but I was just wondering if Francesca has anything else to read. Okay. Okay. Well, he wants me to read. I know which one he wants me to do. He wants me to do my Southern one. I know that. He likes the Southern one. Right? You liked her? Yeah. You like that character? Okay. Well, I, I have a feeling I better just go ahead and do that. 
because um, it's fun. <laughs> I enjoy doing those and I can do a few more with that one because uh, I have a few that I can actually read in that Southern defect style. But hold on a minute because I got to gather up my my hat, my hair. No, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Look at my, my hair. I took off my hat, done ran my pantyhose again in two places, scuffed up my pocketbook on that brick wall over there. Mama calls me a hot mess on a Sunday morning. Been trolloping all Saturday night. Get to the breakfast table. The gravy's getting cold. Oh, law, Grandma done burnt them biscuits again. Guess it's oats today. My poor stomach will be a growling. The preacher hates that sound. Every time he hears a growl, he goes into a sermon and yells out how Jesus brought the disciples together to feed the fish to the multitudes. I'm a Southern defect. My whole family raises their hands in an unspoken prayer request every Sunday. Southern defects can't wait till Monday morning to start all over again. And here's another in my Southern deflect. Oni Spartman picked a bucket of juicy peaches. In church, she always listens as the preacher preaches. Oni would stay up late all night reading her Bible by candlelight. One night, something wasn't quite right. No one could see Oni Spartman's light. The night before supper, Oni Spartman said, I believe I'll eat these peaches until I'm dead. Oni Spartman ate the whole bucket and enjoyed every bite. The next morning, they found Oni Spartman dead the bucket of peaches by her head. If only Oni Spartma would not have went to, went to bed instead, all was left was the pile of peaches by her head. Poor Oni Spartman. Let's see if I have one more that kind of goes with the Southern defect. Uh, she has horses. My friend began to tell us about her horses. I thought owning horses was a very interesting hobby. She lives on a ranch in Texas near George W. Bush. We have conversations about how her favorite horse is named Francesca, which is almost my name, Francesca. I listen close. She tells me how she has a certified horse with cool names like Sunny, Storm, and Blaze and Chase. She takes them to a horse show in Lexington, Kentucky. Every year, she drives from Texas with the horse trailer they own and sells a few horses at the show. I wanted to see photos of those horses. To my surprise, she handed me a photo of miniature plastic horses lined up in her bedroom on her shelf. <laughs> so is that enough or do I need an encore? <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for letting me read that. Sure. Geneva Bowers, would you like to read? <laughs> That's okay if not. Um, I wanted to read one more thing and then maybe we can close up. Oh, no, no, no. Henry wanted to read one. I'm so sorry. Henry would like to read one. Go for it. <laughs> this is a book. This is a poem that's in my book. Um, run into blackness, feeling my poetic gumbo. And um, it, I was commissioned to write this poem about someone I, I did not know anything about her. Her, na her name was Sister Thea Bowman. And I write a lot about black history and things. And people were like, oh, you're, you're not familiar with Sister Thea Bowman. And I found out why, because I'm not Catholic. And she was very pro prevalent in the, um, Catholic community. She was a black nun. And her life basically reflected somewhat like Mother Teresa. Um, she went to different African nations, all of, of Brown, and uh, they, was, they had, um, got all the necessary forms to have Sister Thea Bowman Day. 
And I was asked to write about her. And at first I was uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't know who this woman is, but the um, coordinator of this festival called the Ibeji Festival in Chicago said, well, I'll give you names of people. You can talk to them and here's a book about her. And I was like, well, hey, I like to read. So I listened to their stories, some of nuns, very old. But what I kept hearing is, um, and I thought it was odd, how she worked in countries where there are so many flies. And um, this one particular older nun talked about all the flies and how she couldn't, you know, she would love to be in the church, but she couldn't be outside with the flies. And I, I have a, 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 a detest of flies. But, you know, when we're focused on trying to do something, you sometimes have to eliminate all those things, even if they, they bother you. And um, so I kind of twisted all those words together to come up with a poem that um, I felt that um, reflected it. I'm flipping through the pages here. And um, it's called The Lover of Flies. And let me tell you, <laughs> when you speak of a, 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 a spiritual or religious poem, I think people think that certain imagery would come about, but um, people really enjoyed it. And, and I, but that was me. And I said, well, you ask me. You, you had to know the kind of stuff I, I write. All right, here we go. The Lover of Flies, a tribute to Sister Thea Bowman. As flies, we must soar, fly high and blend with the brightness of the sun. Our black and ugly bodies seem to vanish in its rays, and day becomes filled with our image as something beautiful. There came various sort of corpse draped Golgotha. We gathered, lifted the empty shell to listen to the sea's whispers, which later we called spirituals. We kissed his chapped lips saying goodbye, stroked his knotted woolly hair, probing the deep stigmata which swallowed our fingertips. The flame which attracted us was gone. Our chest filled with the emptiness and of abandoned lover, hoping those arms which held you would return and soothe the pain, draw circles of comfort on the sternum, then wipe away the grief tears with promises and hugs. We searched, flying toward any flicker which promised warmth, hoping to feel the longing only to die by fire or crushed by rejection and deceit. Once there was a lover of flies who didn't swat us, but gave us meat to feast on, a safe place to lay our eggs, watch our children grow. From his love, from her love, we became strong and fearless once considered black and ugly. Through her, we saw our beauty, though abandoned, found hope and direction. Now we live in the sun as flies. We soar without fear. Thank you. And no. Sister Thea Bowman integrated a lot of uh, African-American and African culture and appreciation because she saw in the Catholic Church, it was mainly, you know, Western. Mm -hmm. So she, from her clothing and things like that, and she lectured a lot. And um, I just looked up, I was waiting, this day still celebrated. And uh, I said, you know, that's wonderful. But when I was there, that was the, um, the first day that they celebrated in Chicago at that Ibeji festival. So I felt honored, I felt honored, yeah. You did a beautiful yeah. job. Thank that's you. an amazing poem. Thank you. You're welcome. Lantern Carrier, would you like to read another? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, something seems to have gone funny with my setup here. Okay. Yes, I, oh, uh, what's that? Uh, I'm not sure what happened. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Now we can hear you. There you are. Yeah, I think I'm back. Can you see me? You're back. You're back. <laughs> yeah, there, there is something higher up on the screen. Okay, um, I'll do a Rumi for you. Have you heard of Rumi the mystic? Yes, yes, please do. 
This is called a gift of love. It's a nice way to close. I think so. Both light and shadow are the dance of love. Love has no cause. It is the astrolabe of God's secret. Lover and loving are inseparable and one. Although I may try to describe love, when I experience it, I am speechless. Although I may try to, to write about love, I am rendered helpless. My pen breaks and the paper slips away to that ineffable place where lover, loving, and loved are one. Every moment is made glorious by the light of love. Jalaluddin Mohammed Rumi. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. I love Rumi. I need to study him more. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you know of him, yeah? <laughs> um, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, guys, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a blessing, and, and I've loved hearing everyone and seeing everyone without masks. And we do our best. But thank you guys so much.